With 3 million members searching, SingleMuslim.com proudly sponsors Single Muslim Live. Salam and welcome to the Single Muslim Live, sponsored by SingleMuslim.com with me, Nazi Kitun. We are live here on Sky 752 and across Facebook, Instagram and Twitter and YouTube. Wherever you're watching from, a very warm welcome. You two can join in tonight's discussion and get advice by simply calling through to the studio on 01924231083. Standard rates apply, so please make sure you have the bill payers' permission before you call in. And why not share your thoughts with us on WhatsApp in confidence by messaging us on 079-507-97017. Today's guest is Councillor Liza Begum, and the topic is an amazing one. Is marriage to end all and be all? I hope I got that sentence right. It's a tongue twister for me. Salam alaikum, Liza. Walaikum salam. Thank you so much for having me on the show. No, thank you. It's an honor to actually have you as a guest. Liza is a very good friend of mine, and I was just excited to have her as a guest on here and speak about this delicate topic, actually. Um, before I carry on, Liza, can you quickly introduce yourself to us and just tell us what you're doing at the time because you've done some amazing things in the last month or so um okay so uh my name is Lisa Begum I have been uh I was born and raised in South Westminster I'm a newly elected councillor for Churchill Ward which is in Westminster um it's an ultra marginal ward but I won it this um I won it in a by-election with an 11 percent majority um I'm also a local housing campaigner, and in 2019, I fought a housing campaign against the Duke of Westminster, from, um, who is the richest landlord in the country, um, and I won. Uh, so at the moment, yeah, I'm a newly elected councillor, and I'm just getting to grips with being a newly elected councillor in Westminster City Council. You make me so proud to know you as a friend, you know, like... I've watched your journey going through all, I would call it the war, <laughs> to save, you know, your, the area, the council, the area, and going to the court, the parliament, the house and everything. What was that experience like for you, first of all? So I joined the Labour Party in 2015. And I joined the Labour Party in 2000, I, I mean, I've always had an interest in politics and in social issues and current affairs. Um, but I never really knew how to get involved. So in 2015, I joined the Labour Party because I saw a new leadership and I saw policies that I could really relate to. Um, so the 2019 Labour Manifesto meant everything to me. Um, and I hope that's something we can stick to. Um, so I, I joined the Labour Party in 2015, but I didn't really get involved until 2018. And that was only because the parliamentary candidate at that time just gave me a call and said, why don't you get involved? Um, and then I was elected into the executive committee. So the local labor group have an executive committee um, and I held, so that was my fir the first time I ever held office um, within the executive committee as fundraising officer. Um, and I remember taking that position, not because I wanted to, but because I thought I've done fundraising before, it will be nice and easy for me to get into. Um, and then a year later, I took the position of uh, vice chair campaigns. And, um, and that was something that I was really interested in. I loved campaigning. I worked very closely with the Labour Community Organising Unit. And we, like, we, we ran this housing campaign, where, which was the most uh, highest profile campaign in South Westminster. But I remember when I first started, and you know, living in Westminster, um, I wouldn't say it's the most diverse constituency. Um, so when I went into uh, meetings, I would be the only Muslim woman there, the only, you know, evidently Muslim woman wearing a hijab. Um, but I always thought, and, and when I first went into, you know, so you have these all members meetings every month. And when I first did start attending these all members meetings, I'll be really honest, in the beginning, I didn't really, like I didn't understand the ropes, but I thought if I keep at it, then I'll, I'll kind of understand the technicalities and, you know, 
what what does it mean to pass a motion, etc. And I remember I just kept at it and I attended these meetings and I started getting to know people. Um, and I started like filling those knowledge gaps, the knowledge gaps where I, you know, um, about politics, which I didn't know about. And, um, and one thing that really struck me was the fact that there are so many conversations happening, you know, at the table. And a lot of these conversations really do affect people from uh, marginalized communities. But people from marginalized communities are not consulted. They're not they're not given that uh, opportunity. Sometimes they're not given the opportunity. Sometimes they don't know how to access, you know, um, getting involved in local politics. And so for me, it was a learning curve. And it was a time where I think I really found out what my passion was. And, um, so I spent 10 years of my life working in the NHS as a PA. And I remember it was a Monday to Friday, nine to five. And I, and I first met you when I was working as a PA, I remember. And I remember I'd go into work every single day and I'd be like, is this my life? <laughs> like God must have some kind of purpose for me. And it was in 2018 when I got that call from the parliamentary candidate saying, would you like to get involved? And that's really where my journey began. We start off understanding the background, your background of where you were working for the NHS, where you are now, because we don't get to see people's journey and what's happening behind the scenes. And we have a lot of, we have had a lot of conversations in regards to us females, you know, we're growing, we're getting older, marriage, and, you know, how we have to always think one step ahead of the game or how are we going to manage our expectations in the society? What were the pressures like for you growing up in terms of being a Bangladeshi woman and in the community that you were growing up in? So coming from a South Asian perspective, I think marriage is always spoken about. If you're not married, then why are you not married? Um, is it, and it's, it's always seen as though it's the woman's fault. You know, are you too picky? Um, I don't understand why you're not married. And every time you are in a situation, let's say a family gathering, a wedding, the subject always comes up. And yeah, so, you know, while I was working in the NHS, trying to kind of find out what I wanted to do and what my passions were. On top of that, I also had the pressures of having to find a spouse. And I think, you know, within the South Asian community, women are always kind of given this unrealistic time frame. So you go to university, you graduate by the time you're 21, you need to get a job. Um, and once you've got a job, you get married. Um, there are so many people out there searching for educated wives and then and this could be a huge generalization but from my experience i found that there were always you know men out there who were looking for educated women but then once they got married you know there wasn't that support to um there wasn't that support to help them recognize their passions and support them in pursuing their aspirations and their goals. Um, and I think, so on one hand, there was Lisa, the, a woman with, you know, an intellect who wanted to aspire to do great things and help people, and she's trying to find her feet. And then on the other hand, there was that added pressure of, well, you're now hitting 30, you're not married, when are you going to get married? Um, Whereas with men, they don't have the same pressures. I'm sure men do have the pressures of having to find a spouse and get married, but I feel like they're not given that unrealistic time frame that we as uh, South Asian women are always given. And on top of that, you know, I'll be really honest, I've had my fair share of rejections as well. So, you know, I personally, I, I don't fit the um, the standards of beauty by, Am I going to get in trouble if I say Bengali aunties? <laughs> I'm going to I'm going to use that frame. I don't mean a phrase. I don't mean any offence. But growing up, I always felt that I didn't meet the standards of beauty by Bengali aunties. So you know, um, 
either my weight was a problem or my skin color. Um, I, growing up, I was always paranoid by my nose. Um, and I and I remember when I first came to you as a client, I think by that at that time I had hit rock bottom, and I just didn't like what I saw in the mirror, and I didn't think I was worthy. So there are so many pressures on us, but I think you know as I've there, there came a point where I thought to myself, right, I just need to pursue the things I really want to um, do, um, and then I started pursuing politics, and, um, and you know. Thankfully, my pe- my family were always supportive of the things that I wanted to do. When I think about the pressures I felt, it was always from you know external factors, like my mother receiving calls from you know people in the community saying, "Oh, what's your daughter doing? You know, she's not married yet. Or, you know, are you thinking about her getting married?" And that in you know like in turn that would like really be detrimental to my mother because she would think about it for her she would think about what other people are saying um so when i talk about pressures i always and when i think about pressures i feel like the pressures always came from external factors more than direct family um i'm trying to sorry um yes yeah sorry gone you don't feel like you were pretty enough or you didn't fit the beauty standards first of all I don't understand why anybody will reject you but there are so many things <laughs> you said in terms of and it's a conversation we've had throughout these couple of shows in the past in terms of what are the real expectations and what are we feeding individuals in our community to be what you can't handle, to understand why divorce is happening and all that kind of stuff. And there are some amazing points here in terms of the difference of how females are actually pressured compared to men. And I'm sure as well they have it. And I think we have to somehow surrender along the way to say, look, I know marriage is important, but it will come to me and we're both believers of having faith in this game and we know it's destined to happen and it's going to happen and just saying okay can i focus on my work but we are going to go on a break very quickly and i'm going to come back i've got loads of questions to ask you i just feel like we've warmed up if you guys have tuned in please make sure you call us at the studio the numbers on the screen And I shall see you in a very, very short time and speak to you soon. With 3 million members searching, SingleMuslim.com proudly sponsors Single Muslim Live. With 3 million members searching, SingleMuslim.com proudly sponsors Single Muslim Live. Okay, welcome back. Make sure you text us on 079-507-97017. I want to know your experience. I want to know how you've handled marriage and the pressures of marriage as well. Are you doing a high fly career? Are you following your passion? Tell us something. Tell us, let's see what we have from the audience as well. Going back to you, Liza, thank you so much for sharing that. And it's like I was saying just before we went on break, there's so much there. There's so much things that you just dwelled on in literally three minutes. In terms of, let's go back. I'm going to go back and forth a little bit. Where you are now, you're a counsellor, right? You're counsellor, Liza Begum, for your community in a very, very posh place. You're representing hijabis. You're representing Bangladeshi females. You're representing South Asian, and you're representing females. So there's a lot of hats that you're wearing at the same time. Like, what is, at the back of our heads, as much as we're progressing in our careers, there is also that niggling voice that we have that's been conditioned to us about marriage. How are you handling that right now in the present moment? Um, you know, you're right. I wear lots of hats, and- 
Um, and being a councillor now, I've been, I, I hold public office and a lot of people in the community that may not have noticed me now notice me. And one of the things I've realised is even though I have you know, I've achieved like winning a housing campaign against the Duke, even though I hold public office in one of the richest councils in the country, marriage always still comes up. Um, and I actually wanted to share a personal experience, something that happened uh, two weeks after I got elected as a councillor. I received, um, I was going to say a Facebook message, but I'm going to call it an essay because it was like just essays and essays from a Facebook friend who um, I don't know very well, but they decided to take it upon themselves to advise me um, and they sent me hu a huge essay about why I should be married and they're very happy that I'm a counsellor. They hope that I succeed and I uh, progress in politics, but I must get married. And they also took it upon themselves to um, give me tafsir of like some Quranic verses. Uh, you know, when I think about it, it really annoys me. So I read these messages and before answering, you know, I, I took a while before I replied back to the message and I decided instead of getting into a debate, I just replied back saying, thank you so much for your advice, but I'd prefer not to speak to you about these uh, personal issues. Um, and I left it at that. But it made me realise that it doesn't matter what you do in life, it doesn't matter what you achieve, it just seems like unless, if you're a woman, unless you're not married, then you have a lack of validation. Where I am right now in my life, I have come to the point where I think I, you know, the most important thing for me to do is pursue my dreams, pursue my goals and my aspirations, um, do the things that I've always wanted to do because I truly believe that by following your dreams and living the life that you want to live, you meet like-minded people and everyone's on a different journey. We're put, uh, uh, like we're given this unrealistic um, time frame, like you must be married and you must have children by the age of 13. I'm now in my mid 30s. Um, I would like to think that I'm living my best life. Um, I'm very happy with, with where I am. Uh, and, I, and I've come to the point where I have been able to kind of, before a lot of the pressures would really um, cause me a lot of anxiety. Mm. But now I've come to the point where I can say, no, this is my journey, everyone's journey is different. Um, for some people, they will get married before the age of 30 and, you know, their life will fall into, like, fall into the um, chapters that, is expected from a Muslim woman um, and for others you know our journeys won't be like that and it's fine um, I think we all need to appreciate the fact that we're all on different journeys and we all have a purpose in life and God will you know direct us um, guide us to our purpose um, look I'm so glad you came on the show and I, I hope people who are watching this there are so many females in our boat, in our situation, and relate to, they can relate to us. And I guess, again, you said something, it doesn't matter, you could be a multimillionaire as a Muslim female, run your own business, have your everything together, and yet somebody will still have the audacity to say, oh, you're not married, you know, you're committing haram and all of this stuff. You can never please any everyone. So it's a fine line of pleasing yourself and doing what you have to do. and. There's Islamic teachings there, we have to follow that. And obviously there has been, there's so much beauty in the Quran that says that marriage is mentioned so many times, you know? We have to look at that as well and say, we're not ignoring it. It's just now, it's in this day and age, I personally feel like marriage has been so far removed in the way people think and operate as well, that as a single woman, you have to be t triple times ahead of the game to know what you're getting yourself involved. And again, going back to your first couple of statements saying people want an educated wife, but they don't have the moral support and everything. There's a lot of stuff going on. And again, anxiety, how did this impact you in growing up and letting go of the pressure of marriage as well? So um, in 2016, my younger sibling, she got married before me. 
And I still remember going to... So I was the first family member to go to the um, venue where she was having her henna party. And an auntie looked at me and she goes, what are you doing here? And I was like, oh, I'm, you know, everyone's running late, so I'm here to greet everyone, but you're the bride. I was like, no, I'm not. It's my younger sister. And she couldn't fathom the fact that my younger sister was getting married before me and she made a big deal out of it. And I remember just flippantly answering her and just saying, well, I'm an independent woman. Um, and yeah, she kind of left me alone. But I remember after that, it caused me a lot of anxiety. And I did actually see a CBT th a therapist after that. But that didn't help me because I went to see a CBT therapist, you know, on the NHS who came from a different cultural background uh, from me. So when I was sitting there talking to her about the things that were causing me anxiety, she was just, she couldn't, um, I, I guess she couldn't relate at all. And for her, my issue was very trivial. It was kind of like, you're still young, you know, and she couldn't understand the kind of situation that I was in. There was one thing I wanted to mention, because you mentioned, um, you know, the Dean and stuff. You know, when you look back at things like um, Muslim women of the past, they weren't always just defined by marriage. So you look at um, Khadija bin Khawailid. She was the first wife of the Prophet Sallallahu Before she was married to him, she was a successful businesswoman. Um, she actually initiated um, the proposal and she was older than him. Now, if you bring that scenario into today's day and age, like, it's unheard of. And I don't understand why, because the Prophet ﷺ was an example to all of mankind. Um, so, it sh and not only that, Khadija bin Khawailid was um, a divorcee as well. And all of those things are really looked down upon now. Like, even initiating um, a proposal, you know, like, if you look at the example of Khadija bin Khawailid, I would say to any sisters that are interested in a brother, like, shoot your shot in a halal way. Um, but I don't understand how we've transgressed so much. Uh, you know, even if you look at someone like Fatima al who was um, who was the first woman to establish a university in Morocco, in Fez, um, in the 10th century, little is known about her life, but she's not de she was never defined by marriage she was defined by you know being a successful woman who established a place of knowledge and you know a university which still you know is standing till today i'm going to just mention something the you know the wives of our prophet peace be upon him and you're right you're absolutely right we have we don't even look at those females even for me as when I'm growing up, I know about them, but because we are in such a different time, it feels like their age, who they were, is not taken seriously nowadays. We just know about their history. But when we come to acknowledge where we are, we have to make ourselves understand that it is okay. It is okay that we're not married. We have to surrender to this idea that our time will come. And it's a pressure around us, a lot of females, that they feel that they have to go and get married or settle. And I see this all the time, Liza. I see all the time where females say, okay, my time is running out. But what time is running out? You haven't even lived a life. You don't even know who you are. And I say this, get to know yourself first before you go and get involved in a marriage. I have got a viewer who has sent in a um, question. So we're just going to have a look at this. Bear with me one second. Whoa, okay. Asalaamu Alaikum to Nazia and Liza Begum. Well done to Liza on finding her passion and her ideal job now. It is very hard to do that, by the way, Liza. So congratulations on that and your whole journey as well. Mashallah to her about working on her current job as a hijabi and a Muslim. May Allah reward her. I do agree with Liz that there is more pressure on a Muslim lady to be married and the blame on her if she has a divorce. For her to be married and for her to be somehow a perfect lady who can't speak her thoughts. It's good Liz is speaking her thoughts that is on her mind today. I hope she knows her skin tone is beautiful. See? <laughs> 
Is she single now? Has she had a divorce? Has she tried single Muslim dating app? So, Liza, are you single now? Well, now <laughs> I've not been married and I haven't had a divorce. Um, have I used a single Muslim dating app? Yes, I have. <laughs> And there was a period of time where I was like, you know, I think a lot of things have moved online now. So people are going onto dating apps, whether it's Muzmatch or Single Muslim. Um, and I think it's like, from my personal experience, it's really a hit and miss, you know. And I, I, I would describe myself as a really passionate person. So I'm a person that likes to sit down and, you know, discuss things and have long conversations. And it's just difficult to um, engage over a laptop, you know. Um, I think, you know, yeah, online, like these online services are amazing. They do provide a service which is needed. But I think with it comes a lot of... Um, you have to be careful as well because you don't always know who you're speaking to on the other end of the screen. We're going to come back to this in a second. We're going to go on another break. This in the conversation is very interesting. And I love to hear from you guys as well, the followers, the audience. Your views matter. So please make sure you message us on 07950-797-017. See you in a short while. searching singlemuslim.com proudly sponsors single muslim live with three million members searching singlemuslim.com proudly sponsors single muslim live Welcome back to another brilliant show, third part of the show, so that's why I meant. Make sure you call us on the studio 01924231083 or why not text us on 07950-797-017. Thank you for everybody who's taking the time out to message us. I have got another message is coming, thank you. Okay, this one is a bit of a long one, so I'm gonna read it out again, Liza. I hope Liza Bacon's anxiety is much better inshallah i have a little anxiety myself of course marriage isn't the be all and end of all and in life some single mothers and some single fathers can look after their child good alhamdulillah a beautiful example about our prophet sallam and khadija today of course older lady can, older, older ladies can marry a younger muslim guy if she wants my question is, what advice would she give to Muslim guys in finding a Muslim lady as herself or Nazia thoughts to a young Muslim guy to find a good partner one day, inshallah? Of course, online dating isn't the only option. We seem to live in a mindset that's the only way now. So I'm going to repeat that question again to you, Liza. <laughs> okay. Um, what advice would you give to Muslim guys in finding Muslim ladies like yourself and like me? Like, what advice would we give to Muslim guys? Actually, this is a really good one. Like, what would we want to hear from? What would we like to see from these Muslim guys that we, where we are opinionated, where we are educated, where we speak our mind? Because it is an issue for a lot of guys in today's society. What would you say to somebody who's probably coming to your proposal? So I think, you know, um, if you think about the kind of woman that you want, you also need to think about the kind of person she would want to be with. Um, so, you know, if, if you're interested in someone who, who finds their, you know, who's very passionate about things, who wants to progress, who wants to flourish in their professional life. You also need to be that person that's happy to support them. So I think a few, like, um, a few minutes ago, I had mentioned um, men looking for educated women, and once they got married, they didn't support them in um, pursuing their dreams and aspirations. And they usually use the guise of, you know, but you need to raise the children. 
but marriage is a partnership mm. where the husband and wife need to raise the children. The husband and wife need to support each other in um, reaching their goals. And the husband and wife both need to come to a compromise as well and be realistic about things. Um, but what you see a lot of the times is a woman always, um, there's that imposition on women to support their husbands in reaching their goals and being successful. And it's okay for a man to, you know, be the CEO of a company and also be married and be a father and, and, and have so many different titles and, and it's, you know, encouraged. But it doesn't matter if a woman is a CEO of a company, if she's just, you know, started her own business, if she is flourishing in her professional life, there's always that question of, but is she married? Um, and I think to the gentleman asking that question, um, I like. I think the most important thing is being a supportive person and knowing that when you do get married, she's also a, a being that has dreams and aspirations just like you. Hundred percent. I love that. See, this um, this is the crucial part to understand. A Muslim single female has also got aspiration. Like I remember, I'm going to share this. Um, incident once when I was 24 I had my first ever proposal come to their house and the young guy was um you don't have to work Nazia you know back in North London the females stay at home and the guys go to work and it was such a weird concept and I turned around and I said to him my father didn't educate me and spend time working so he can fund for my university fees for me to stay at home for me to be a housewife and he took him quite back and I remember at that point, I really stood my ground to say, I'm going to work because it gives you a purpose in life. Like there are things that we want to do, travel the world, to be someone. And that's, this is, I guess, what I'm trying to get at, is that we are somebody. We're not just somebody's wife. We're not just somebody's daughter. We're not just somebody's a title, right? There's more to us than just being married and being fixated in this label of marriage. So it's important that we understand that as well. And I had um, Saba who came on like three weeks ago and we had a very interesting topic of, um, I can't remember the title, Re rediscovering yourself after divorce. And there was some beautiful gem that she put in there that your life doesn't end after you divorce. And it's the same thing I want to say to like our audience today. If we are not married as a, at a certain age, it's not the end of our life. There is so much more to look forward to. And it's something that's ingrained in our communities as well. And that leads me to ask you then, Liza, why do you think um, marriage has been such an important focus in our Bangladeshi community or the South Asian community? Um, I just want you to say, actually, you know what, before I begin to answer that question, one of the things I wanted to say is there's nothing wrong with women wanting to stay at home and being a housewife, you know, if that's what they wish to do. And I think the other thing that we need to recognise is the fact that um, just growing up, like you mentioned, Nazia, you know, we, you know, we do go through the British um, education system, we work, we travel, and then all of a sudden there is this like kind of expectation that you abandon all of those things after you get married. So then you also have women that have this fear of, um, oh my gosh, if I get married, is that gonna be the end of my freedom? Uh, now going back to the question that you asked me, um, why are you so fixated within the South Asian community when it comes to marriage? Your guess is as good as mine. I feel like from a very, very young age, um, it's always been a huge issue, um, especially when it comes to women. I think men are now speaking up about the pressures they feel um, with regards to marriage, but from, you know, being a really young girl, always, you know, like going to weddings, hearing people talk about um, so-and-so is getting married. I, I don't understand where this fixation came from. Um, apart from the fact that, you know, if you look back in history and you do see um, women like Khadija bin Khawailid or Fatima al-Fihdi or um, Zainab Ahmed, who was an Islamic scholar in the 14th century, 
you know, when we had such successful women doing such amazing things, how did we regress? And where did this regression come from? Um, and is it misogyny? Is it, you know, men interpreting uh, religion in a, in a way which will benefit them? Maybe. Is it um, male chauvinism? Uh, like, those are the things that I can think of. But, you know, we come from a very patriarchal society. And I guess we've allowed um, men to kind of create a narrative. And, and you know, women, women have kind of, through the years, they've kind of been um, just looked at as, as people that, you know, are like reproductive machines who should be getting married. And that's, and through marriage is their only validation. Yeah. Like, I've got something written here, I just want to read it out. And it says, and among his sign is this, that he created for you mates from among yourself, that you may dwell in peace and tranquility with them. And he has put love and mercy between your hearts, right? As humans, we all want to be loved. As humans, we're all looking for a companion. And yet there is so much trauma around marriage pressures for individuals that I have dealt with, even myself, like strong characters like yourself, like me, females, you know, South Asian females are seen as being weak and submissive, and they're not. We are not submissive. We are not weak-minded. We have, we have got a vision. We just haven't been able to explore our opportunities because... You know, we, we're labeled, we're put in a box, we're told to be this, to follow the narrative, the stereotypical way of going through life. And I have seen this time and time after again, where we're yearning to be loved, where we're yearning to be um, accepted as well. What happens is a female growing up, she has all these pressures on her. And at the same time, she's trying to uphold her family's reputation, honor, her father's name, rep all of these kind of things that is, which then leads to toxic relationship, leads to desperation. And that then in turn, a lot of females are realized as well, they settle. They settle, even men, they settle because what happens is they don't know what they want from themselves, then they don't know what they want from one another. And then it becomes this horrible mess, a chaotic mess. And I guess like trauma around the marriage pressure is something we don't speak about. And personally for myself as well, when I look back and reflect in my 20s, I spent trying to please my parents, feeling like I was a burden, feeling like I disappointed them. And as adults, that manifests into different areas of our lives as well. So everything that you said there, Liza, as well, like there's so much beauty in there. And I hope like whoever's watching this again, they are able to see that, you know, you can become whoever you want to become. And my message is follow your passion. Do what makes you happy first. We will be going on a break really, really shortly. And um, to everybody who's been messaging us, thank you so much. And we're going to come back from a break and ask Liza a few more questions around her personal, um, how do I call it, her mindset before and after and coming back. But before we go on a break, do you think, Liza, something to, for us to think about, actually, before we go on a break, do you think there is a fine line of us as females, you, me, serving our duties in Islam in regards to marriage and then choosing a path of doing what we enjoy, right? Do you think we can become fixated on the path of following this passion, this mission. I'm going to come back to you in a bit to ask for you to think about and answer this. We will be going on a break. So, so far we have been discussing about is marriage the be all and end all of life? Do you females in the South Asian community, um, Bangladeshi community, <laughs> Pakistani community, do we have it more harder than men? We would love to hear from you, so please don't forget to contact us on 07950-797-017. We've had an amazing discussion, and when we come back, we're going to be exploring a few more things around trauma. I really want to um, ask Liz a few questions around trauma around this, because it's important, and mental health right now is something we really, really need to address with COVID, 
with lockdown, I'm sure we've had a lot of um, mental space and gap to allow us to reflect. So please join us in the last section and I shall see you very, very soon. Members searching singlemuslim.com proudly sponsors Single Muslim Live. With three million members searching singlemuslim.com proudly sponsors Single Muslim Live. Welcome back to the final part of the show. I'm going to go straight to Liza because the question I asked before we left was, Liza, do you think there is a fine line of us serving our duties in Islam in regards to marriage and then choosing a path in terms of our passion and our career and what we're doing? Um, I think, of course, marriage is really important. Um, my only, I think the most difficult thing is the fact that we are given an unrealistic time frame. Um, is there a fine line between pursuing our passion um, and the things we want, as well as, you know, getting married, having a family? I, th I think we can juggle both with, you know, so with a supportive spouse. And, um, I think it needs to be, like I um, mentioned earlier, um, I think it, I think people need to realize that marriage is a partnership. I'll give you an example. Like when you're talking about raising children, it's usually uh, the large, um, the, the, the responsibility is largely, you know, always placed on the women. And when men take care of their children because their wife might need a break, it, they call it babysitting. You can't babysit your own children. Um, you're raising your children. And I think, you know, if you're like my advice to any woman right now who's single who wants to get married enjoy the journey you know while you're looking for that spouse and inshallah you'll meet someone amazing and i still have a lot of hope and i'm still very optimistic you know while you're going through that journey enjoy that journey and while you're going through that journey pursue your dreams as well because in you know pursuing your dreams it might be that you meet you know lots of like-minded people and you meet uh, the person that you're meant to be with um so yeah i think you know i, I think you can do both i think that's um, a very valid thing you said there as well like in terms of the roles that we play as a female and a male when it comes to raising family when it comes to partnership in a marriage what does it mean like, how do we go? And these are the things that we all need to actually sit down and talk about to our future or to ourselves, make a list of all these things. Um, thank you so much for sharing that because I feel like sometimes maybe I, I, feel, I feel bad sometimes. Like, am I too driven in my career? Am I too driven in the things that I'm enjoying right now? Have I forgotten about marriage? And the answer is no. I'm always thinking about marriage. I'm just doing what I have to do whilst, I guess, waiting. That's the key word that they will say. Um, so do what you're doing. Um, enjoy life along the way as well. Makes life so much more easier finding a spouse as well, I guess. We have a message from um, a viewer. Thank you so much. This is a long one, Liza. So please bear with me. Um, I just switched to your channel now. This topic has been ongoing for decades and probably always will be, will do sadly. We cannot always choose our lifestyle as some of us don't get many things in life that we want. Example, marriage or even a preferred partner, preferred job, preferred resident, country, having children, etc. Unfortunately, our women are our own worst enemies, especially our own relatives, shamefully. Instead of helping they hinder by spreading faults or malicious rumors, sometimes by envy, and that makes it impossible to get married. I know genuinely practicing sisters in their 40s, 50s, professionals, educated females, still single, unmarried, unable to find a good Muslim husband. By the way, they're not all too fussy and not looking for Mr. Perfect. 
People tend to judge these single ladies by stereotyping them without knowing anything about the sister. Some sisters have lowered criteria in order to marry, marry but got nowhere. The older men tend to marry youngsters who have had no life experiences and ignore the older sisters who have life-sized life experiences and wisdom, sadly. On the other hand, we have guys marrying white new Muslims and ignoring all born brown-skinned, no matter how good she is. There's a lot in this message. <laughs> There's a lot in that message, yeah. And there are so many truths in that message as well. Um, I don't even know where to start with that message. Like, yeah, this is mentioned a lot of truths, and I and I think there needs. You know, I know she said that, you know, this has been going on for decades and it probably will carry on. But I'm hopeful that there will be a paradigm shift and hopefully that will happen, you know, with future generations where people stop having these like certain um, criteria around marriage. Um, you know, I'll, I'll give you an example. So for many years, I um, volunteered in a lot of Muslim charities and stuff. And without going into too much detail, I felt like there was a lot of toxic masculinity, a lot of misogyny. And that's something our community as a whole need to be honest about, need to have conversations around. And, and there has to be a shift. Um, but I see young Muslim women uh, younger than me who are saying no to this toxic masculinity, who are, you know, not putting up with it. Whereas when I was in my early 20s and I was volunteering for a lot of these charities, I did put up with it because I just thought, you know, that's just the way it is. And so I do think there will be a change and I really hope there is. And, um, you know, I can totally empathise with the sister and with what she's saying. One thing she did mention was... Um, a lot of sisters lower their standards and even then, you know, they struggle to um, find a spouse. One of my favorite um, Islamic uh, speakers, Muhammad al Sharif, he always says, don't lower your standards, raise your dua. And so my advice is always don't lower your standards, raise your dua. The second thing is, you know, we need to accept the fact that we're all on a different journey. We all, you know, we all have a purpose in life and and yeah marriage isn't the end all and be all like it's important and it's something that you know of course you should pursue but as well as that you know you can't stay stagnant in your life you know you need to pursue your passion and do other things as well just to go back to this message there is things that we have to unlearn as well, right? There's a lot that she said. Like for you and me, Lisa, we had to unlearn habits. We had to learn beliefs as well around this topic. Like, for example, if you believe you're getting too old, that is what you're going to feel all the time, right? But if you believe also that there is a guy out there for you, you have to just somehow change your mindset around it as well and change your perspective around it as well. And one of the best advice I give to some of my clients who are on the same boat as me is constantly remind yourself the good things that you have to offer. Become the person that you want to become in a marriage. And it's like learning these things from like tools and techniques from going to therapists, going to speak to somebody. And it's hard to actually articulate how you're feeling sometimes because the conflict has been so ingrained in us from a very young age. So we don't know what's going on with our emotions at times. Um, so thank you so much to this person who took the time out to actually write this. We have another one, Liza. And this is a question for you, actually. Um, what would Liza say makes a good marriage? I know we spoke about this briefly. Is communication the good thing, the thing that makes a good marriage? Is a respect, teamwork between two people um, that makes a marriage last? Is it important to be in a good, healthy relationship? Yes, it is. <laughs> yes, it is. But Liza, what do you think makes a good, healthy relationship, a marriage? 
first and foremost, um, the person that you get married to is someone who is first your friend, and there is and and uh, you know actually everything that person um, mentioned respect communication teamwork they're all really really important things in a marriage um, and you need to ensure that you're compatible um, Nazi I think you mentioned um, previously about people settling and you do get that a lot in the community because of the pressures of marriage people just settle and like when it comes to specifically South Asian women Sometimes our lives are like a tick box activity. You know, you get your education, you get your job, then you get married, then you have children and you raise your children and that's it. Um, but yeah, um, I, I think the the person who's given you that question, they've, they've more or less answered the question. Communication is, compatibility is really important. You know, you ensure there's that friendship. Um, and then yeah, respect, teamwork, all of those things are really important. Mm. There is something that just came at the top of my head and it's um, learning about love languages. We all have a set of love languages, the way we want to be received, loved. And your partner also has his own language, her own language and how they want to be loved. And it's five steps. There's touch, quality time, active services, gifts. And I can't remember the last one. I suggest you guys go and um, look it up. It's a quiz, yeah? And... Find out the language of love and learn to do it yourself first. It will change things about you and you address looking for the other person in a different light as well. So, Lisa, we're nearly coming to the end of the show. And before we go, um, I had a private question coming through my WhatsApp as well. Loneliness. Loneliness is something we haven't spoke about and I would love to speak about that maybe on another show. Um, do you get lonely sometimes? <laughs> I think everyone does. That's like, yeah, of course. And and I think um, just naturally, it's it's just in us as human beings to want companionship. Um, and actually, loneliness is a London-wide problem. <laughs> so yeah, I th I think that's that's something you know, that's something that's inevitable. Um, but you know, being it's something that affects everyone. And I, and I think there are ways of tackling loneliness, whether it's, you know, surrounding yourselves around family and friends, um, making sure you keep yourself busy. Yeah. On that note, we have come to the end of the show. Um, Liz Avegam, thank you so much for being a guest um, so late at night. And it's an honor to speak to you. And I wish you all the best and the success for the future. We will be seeing Eliza a lot on the news and mainstream media, no doubt. To everybody who has tuned in, um, thank you so much. And we would love to hear from you. Give us some ideas that you would love for the coming shows. In the meantime, have a very good evening and I shall see you again next week from myself and the team at British Muslim TV. Asalaamu Alaikum. Members searching, singlemuslim.com proudly sponsors Single Muslim Live.